Welcome to Peninsula Beat. I'm Maria Sorrell. There's growing concern about increased noise from aircrafts flying over the peninsula. Rancho Palos Verdes Mayor Susan Brooks discussed the issue with Liz Brown Swanson here in our studios. For several years, um, and it seems like every seven to ten years, um, we have this problem with overflights at night. So what would happen is the planes that come around the peninsula um, at night they would be suddenly flying over the, over the peninsula instead of staying five miles out where they're supposed to stay in the water and reaching an elevation of 13,000 feet before they come over the peninsula. So it came back again a couple of years ago and uh, I was trying to, in desperation to get something done and then when I got on the council decided, you know, this isn't working. So I said, I want to know where this is taking place and found out that it's actually not happening at LAX in the evening. The decisions are being made at TRACON down in San Diego. So visited down in San Diego, went to visit with some staff members and Councilman Knight came along. Um, we went to TRACON, the TRACON facility, which is top security clearance. It was amazing. And we were able to see what they're doing exactly. Um, how many flight controllers, I mean, how many lives are in how many hands at that mm -hmm. time. And there is a, they were very, very concerned about these overflights. What we are encouraging people to do is to use this LAX web track. And we're going to show this to Which all is of our absolutely residents. fascinating. And the more complaints they get, if this continues. So you're showing us so that if people in the community are feeling that they're hearing noise from flights over the peninsula, they can go on to, this is provided by LAX, this website, right? LAWA.org. Yeah, LAWA, Los Angeles World Airport. Airports.org. So LAWA.org, LAWA log on, and then you can go on to basically their flight trackers or what that it's called. This is actually the noise um, complaint um, page. Page, yeah. And the idea of this, too, is not only, obviously, is not just to see these flights, but to actually you can file a complaint on this site. And, and on this site, thing. what you can do is file this complaint. You have the exact identified type of aircraft. It'll say whether it's a 727, 737, uh, what the exact elevation is. Yeah, if you want to keep track of your loved ones, you know when their flight is coming in. You can and residents will be do their due diligence, and then when they're hearing flights, get on and follow. And if complaint. you want to just see something really uh, extraordinary, just get onto this web track. It can be absolutely hypnotizing. Okay. <laughs> Mayor Brooks is emphasizing that residents can go to the website at lawa.org and file a complaint regarding aircraft noise. The City of Rancho Palos Verdes Public Works staff and the RPV Traffic and Safety Commission will hold the last community workshop on the Palos Verdes Drive East Roadway Resurfacing and Improvement Project. RPV residents are encouraged to attend the workshop, which will be held at Marymount College on Wednesday, March 13th at 7 p.m. RPV Mayor Pro Tem Jerry Dehovic and City Council Member Jim Knight attended the prior workshops and they talked with Liz Brown Swanson about the plans to fix PV Drive East. Give us a little bit of a timeline of what the project actually involves and really why we need to be doing this in the city at this time. Sure, if I may. Start. The um, number one, again, the timeline is early summer of this year through the end of this year. Okay. Uh, the project includes uh, fixing the road, replacing the road where need be, uh, resurfacing the other areas that don't need to be uh, completely removed and repaired, uh, repairing sidewalks, curbs, gutters, uh, guardrails, vegetation remediation, um, adding some retaining walls in certain areas, um, reconfiguring the, the geometry of certain roads as they enter Palos Verdes Drive East, um, signage, dealing with, with bike lanes and bike access, uh, and obviously restriping. And that's, this is the first part, uh, it's, it's a major part of the remediation, and I also want to mention that there's a second phase uh, coming down the pipeline 24 months from now that, oh, okay. that, that deals specifically with the area between Bronco and Headland, which is a, a major point of concern with citizens in that particular area. And also trail uh, um, configurations and equestrian usage issues. It, it's a very important project. That road was built by the county a long time ago that had different standards of road width, 
curvature of road and so on. The actual road easement in some places goes through people's homes and backyards. So there's a whole lot of complexities we're being thrown into our lap now to try to resolve. And um, it's, it's beyond just fixing potholes and resurfacing and restriping. There's a lot of safety issues, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Certain curvatures, of, like Bronco, a very sharp curve there. Um, and we also need to address how are we going to accommodate bicycles, yeah. pedestrians, and equestrians. There are certain parts of the road that may need to be widened, even with a retaining wall, for that matter, to, to widen them out. Uh, other parts of the road, um, there already is a little bit of a side kind of walkway, but what's happening is that people are parking on there uh, off the street, it's kind of half off the street and half on this little parking area. So it's not only it's kind of dangerous to have that, but it um, interferes with the equestrian, pedestrian, bicycle use. So there's a lot of issues. It's a very complex issues we're dealing with. Uh, one of the major things we're also doing is um, uh, restriping in front of the Miralist Intermediate School because we want to make sure it's a safe, that's right. a really important safety issue. For more information about PV Drive East Workshop on March 13th, call the RPV Public Works Department at 310-544-5252. Well, it's an event that brings our city together every year for a whale of a good time. Mark your calendars for a whale of a day, which takes place at the Palace Fruities Interpretive Center on Saturday, March 2nd. Liz Brown Swanson sets up the preview for the big day. This year is our 29th year for the whale of a day, and we are so excited. We have um, quite a few returnees coming back. We have the Aquarium of the Pacific Touch Tank, which is always a popular event, and that's sponsored by Harbor Breeze. Uh, cruises and then we have um, live animals. Last year we had the timber wolf, eagle and the llama and this year we are going to have animals as, as long as the weather holds. Of course the big celebration here with Whale of a Day is to celebrate the whale migration and so we're inside today to enjoy the inside of Interpretive Center but outside is where the whale counting is happening, the census. Talk about just what's going to be going on that day outside. Oh. We normally have about 20 different organizations, for environmental organizations, Palos Verdes Land Conservancy, um, Native Plant Society, so um, environmental organizations throughout the peninsula, and then we have activities for the kids. We have whale watching, of course, is going on. That's, this is one of our biggest years for whale watching. It's beat um, the last average of 10 years. We've, we've actually beat the number as they're seeing, so we're hoping to see lots of whales on Whale of a Day. The reason we have it on the first um, Saturday of the month is generally the whales are going both north and south, and it's our best opportunity for people to see them from the shore. I started the full-time census back on January 1st, 1984. Didn't think we'd still be here 30 years later, but it's really terrific. Well, it's unbelievable, and every year you see something different out here with the whales that you're counting. Talk about, just go to this year right now, it's been very exciting. This year's been really exciting. We're up to right now 663 gray whales, that includes the seven this morning, and this is the highest southbound count we've had for 16 years. It's varied from about 250 to almost 900. This is a fantastic year. Can you explain why the numbers are up? Because were they also up last year as well? Yeah, last year and this year we actually had early migrating gray whales. Last year our peak for the southbound happened at the end of December, beginning of January. It's generally about the third week of January. This year we also saw some early gray whales. In fact, we were kind of neck and neck with last year, but now we pulled ahead. This year we believe, for a couple of reasons, one is that the major feeding areas in the Arctic iced over early. So the gray whales could not die below the ice and be able to come up and breathe. They are bottom feeders. So we believe that instead of the shortened days initiating the southbound migration, it was actually the inability to get enough food. So they left early and headed down the coast. But we still peaked about the third week of January. So it's pretty cool. I always ask you when I talk to you, like, what are the tips for the tricks for seeing them? I have a really difficult time spotting them, even when you're telling me the markers to look through. I mean, I, I can see them when they're blowing, and uh, unless they're jumping up, which you don't often see, them breaching. Um, what are tips for people that come out here? Well, number one, have binoculars. Number two, they could be seen any time of day. People will say, is morning or afternoon better? Whenever you could see the water, it's not foggy, hopefully not too windy, but have those binoculars with you. Then we'll look for the flukes or tail of the whale. 
Then also on a calm day, we'll look for prints, their flute prints. Their tail, when it comes up, leaves a smooth circle of water. So we look for any kind of disturbance in the water. So any of those things could be a cue that a whale is here. We also will look for whale watching boats because sometimes boat activity could be a cue that there could be something going on. You had one amazing day out here this season. I'm sure they're all amazing for you because you're so passionate about what you're doing. But the one day where you thought you guys saw a pod of 30 whales, that oh. was just huge. It was on January 20th. And our census observers here was about three miles offshore. And there were so many blows coming up, so many blows that they knew couldn't be gray whales because gray whales typically are in actually singles or pairs or trios. If we see a group of six whales, we're really excited. We had one group in January of nine. And so they had a whale watch boat go over and check it out. And the whale watch boat reported it was sperm whales. And that would be a very large group of sperm whales that's only been seen once in, well, 30 years. So I dropped everything and headed out on the next available boat. And the census volunteers guided us to that spot so we know it was the same sighting. And even miles away, I could tell it was gray whales. So I was initially very disappointed because I was all excited about sperm whales. But then as I took a look, it was reported to be like 15 or 20. I could tell, oh, it's more than 15. No, no, this is more than 20. This is actually the largest sighting that I've ever seen. The previous sighting, big sighting that we had was five years ago, was 18. The biggest I've seen is about 15. So this was absolutely tremendous. I got photos of 18 different flukes, and some of the whales didn't fluke. So it was amazing. And the next day, they were seen off San Diego, apparently the same group. Years ago, about five years ago, I came in here as a visitor, and I saw these wonderful people yelling about whales. Blue whales, gray whales, humpback whales, and I said, hey, this is fun. I was retired by then. I figure, well, how do I sign up? They said, just come on over. We'll, we'll give you all the information. We'll teach you how to detect the whales in the water. And that was it. That was the beginning of this wonderful experience. And coming up next, Marymount College invites you to a very special event for the very first time. And you'll get a sneak peek into the International Bird Rescue. Having an emergency plan in place before an emergency is crucial for your family. It's impossible to know what kind of emergency we will be facing or when it will happen. We know that fires, earthquakes, and power outages are a part of life in Southern California. The City of Rancho Palos Verdes Emergency Preparedness Committee recommends that you take an all-hazards approach to emergency planning. Do you have a seven-day supply of non-perishable food and water on hand? Do you have copies of your tax returns, insurance policies, and other important documents? Do you have an extra supply of medications for yourself and your animals? Do you have an extra supply of medications for yourself and your animals? Visit our city website or come to the Emergency Preparedness Committee meetings and learn how you and your family can get prepared for an emergency. Visit our city website or come to the Emergency Preparedness Committee meetings and learn how you and your family can get prepared for an emergency. Go to www.palosverdes.com rpv today. L.A. County fire officials are warning residents there has been a significant number of house fires in our area. For more on the story, we go to Laura Walters from L.A. County Fire Department, who addressed the issue before the RPV City Council. Laura Walters, L.A. County Fire. I just wanted to um, remind everybody of a few things. We've had um, a few significant house fires um, in January here on the Hill and they've been caused by chimney fires, fireplace issues. So I just wanted to remind people of a few things. One, make sure they have spark arresters on the top of the chimneys. Um, also make sure that you clean the chimney every year. The soot that builds up in there is flammable and it does, it can catch, catch on fire. And if you already have something, a weakness within the chimney, um, part of the problem why those house, the chimney fires turned into such significant fires was uh, it ended up breaching into the attics. So once it breaches your attic, that is a real problem. And also only burn firewood in a fireplace. Don't burn cardboard, magazines, anything like that. Um, those things tend to burn very hot and can also cause embers. One of the situations, somebody still had a shake roof and they were burning cardboard and embers flew up onto the, um, to the roof. 
So those are just a few things. Everybody can always go on our site. I know I emailed some things to the city staff. And um, again, it's just be careful. We're in the midst of winter when everybody likes to burn those fireplaces. <laughs> For more information on fire safety tips, you can go to the LA County Fire website at lacountyfire.gov. Neighborhood watch groups are reminding local residents to take extra steps to secure their homes and protect their neighborhoods from crimes. According to Lameda Sheriff's Department Captain Blaine Bolin, the crime rate dropped last year 8% in Rancho Palos Verdes, but did increase during the month of January 2013. Liz Brown Swanson talked to the captain about the latest crime trends here on the Hill. We're very pleased we uh, finished 2012 uh, with a decrease in crime in many of the key areas. Uh, Rancho Palos Verdes in our part one crimes, which are our serious high grade felonies, assaults, burglaries, thefts, grand theft autos, and, and the like, we were down 8% from 2011. Our burglaries were down 7%. Our grand theft autos were down 10%. Uh, Rolling Hills Estates showed even uh, uh, bigger deficit, 20% uh, in burglaries and 25% in GTAs. Right now though, in 2013, we've had 29 burglaries to date. What's going on? Well, you know, we, and we've taken a look at that and you know, some interesting things have come out of our assessment. Uh, we've, of those 29, none were on Sunday, five were on Saturday, the rest were during the week. So, and that's consistent with crime on the peninsula, and usually Monday through Fridays. Folks, are, you know, kids are at school, folks are working, homes are uh, um, empty. And uh, what we've noticed too uh, is six of the homes burglarized in 2013 were either being remodeled or under some sort of construction. And a few of the burglaries, there was no loss that was reported at the time the uh, burglary report was taken. Just folks come home and believe someone had made an entry, a door was, or a window was open, door was left unlocked. And uh, so there, beyond that, there's really no crime pattern that we can point to at this point, but we're still looking at it. And we do have, with a couple of the burglaries, information that we're working, that we're hopeful will help us uh, lead to a, uh, a resolution, resolution being an arrest, recovery right. of property, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Captain Bolin encouraged residents to check out the Lamita Station website for the latest crime information and safety tips at lamita.lasd.org. And in 2013, the way you receive mail from the U.S. Postal Service will change. In an effort to cut costs, Saturday delivery for first-class mail will come to a halt. Postmaster General Patrick Donahue said package delivery, which has seen growth in recent years as online purchasing booms, will continue when the plan is implemented in August. He said the plan is expected to save about $2 billion annually. Under the new schedule, post office hours will not change. And coming up next, you'll meet a Palos Verdes student athlete who excels in sports and in the classroom. We'll be right back. Caution, you have entered the Peninsula Extreme Fire Danger Zone. Prepare for an emergency before disaster strikes. Clear all brush and weeds 35 to 200 feet around your house. Make sure to have 10 feet of clearance around the chimney and do not store firewood or flammable materials next to your house. Remove all dead trees. Dry and dead trees will explode in a fire and send sparks quite a distance. Top and prune trees as a precaution, especially near utility lines. Do not plant trees on slopes. Instead, use ground cover or hillside to help hold the ground from eroding and keep fires from progressing. If trees are not topped and pruned, they become heavy during the rainy season and will pull down the tree and roots, causing mudslides. Trees not mended on a hillside in a fire with winds will feed the fire. Install sprinklers around your house. It's your home. Be safe and protect it. Keep debris such as pine needles and leaves cleaned off your roof and out of your gutters. Remember, the peninsula is an extreme fire danger zone. Use these tips and keep your family safe during the fire season.
Visit our city website or come to the Emergency Preparedness Committee meetings and learn how you and your family can get prepared for an emergency. And in sports, I had a chance to sit down with Rylan Delbrebus, who runs cross country at Palos Verdes High School. And to say he's one of the most motivated athletes I've ever met would be an understatement. In addition to all of the titles he holds in cross country, Rylan excels in the classroom. Now here's more on what makes this PV senior so successful. What has driven you so hard so early on? Uh, that's a good question. I guess it's it's just kind of how I was raised. Um, my mom always has been on me about. I mean, from a from a young age, my mom had already always been on me about homework and stuff like that. Um, and so I guess that kind of set the seeds, you know. And from then on, I kind of just, you know, I liked achieving stuff, you know, and I liked running a lot when I started doing that. And so when I when I do something, when I focus on something, whether it be schoolwork or running or uh, you know, live from 205, I really like to put a lot of a passion and energy into it, and I think that's what's gotten me results. And, and what inspired you to start running? Um, I, when I was, you know, in elementary school, you know, everyone does, like, the, the soccer with ASO and, like, Little League and stuff like that, and I was always okay at soccer. I was always okay at baseball, but never really, like, club team type level at that age, and so, but one thing I knew I was good at is I had some running speed, and and some endurance. I like to play midfield in soccer. Um, and so um, in elementary school, I got signed up for a program called uh, SC Roadrunners, Southern California Roadrunners. Um, and that was just like a, a track club thing for young kids. And it wasn't competitive at all. It wasn't like a club, you know, you know, that you go out to a bunch of big races or anything. It was just to kind of learn about running. And that's what got me started. And from then, I did that all the way through middle school. And then when I started uh, high school, I joined the freshman team cross country, and I loved it, and kind of took off from there. Yeah, yeah during a race, um, one of the most challenging things is just, it's less a physical barrier than a mental barrier. Mm -hmm. When things start to get tough, you know, like your, your legs start to hurt, your breathing starts to get hard and stuff like that, but whether we know it or not, like we are capable of more than we think we are as human beings. And so if you mentally can just push past that barrier, then, you know, you'll run great times. You'll break your own personal records and stuff like that. And so it's, it's mostly a mental thing, I feel. Um, I mean, certainly the more training you do, the more physical ability you have, and therefore, you know, the faster you can run. But to really reach your limits, that's a mental thing. Now, what do you think, this, your, being, this is your last year here um, at PV High, what are you looking to accomplish in the last year? Um, I think, I mean, I've already gotten into a great university, which is one of my, you know, main goals. I'm not, I haven't decided there yet. I'm still waiting on some, to hear from some of the schools, but it's definitely good to hear from MIT. Yeah, yeah, I heard <laughs> um, I guess, I mean, really all that's left is to have a great track season, which is in the spring. So, um, I, you know, there are a lot of runners in the past, um, like, no, like the year before I got here, there's a big thing about how a bunch of the varsity cross country runners quit during trek. They're like, I'm done. But yeah, and but I feel like, you know, after all these years, why would I quit now? You know, I, I want to go out with a with a bang, with a good track season. And this year, for the first time, Marymount College's Health and Wellness Fair will be open to the public. Mark your calendars for Tuesday, March 5th from 12 to 1.30. I caught up with wellness counselor Aaron Scott Haynes with more on the event. Thank you. 
And finally, the International Bird Rescue Center in San Pedro is looking for volunteers. More than 10 years ago, the center opened its doors at Fort MacArthur in San Pedro. And since then, the team has saved thousands of injured aquatic birds. The center is typically closed to the public, but Liz Brown Swanson had the opportunity to tour the facility, and she joins us now. Liz.
And that will do it for us from everyone here at RPV TV. Make it a great day. Thank you.